How are you guys doing? Well, awesome. So as you know, we're wrapping up our trending sermon series where we've been looking at some difficult questions in our faith, and we thought it'd be kind of a neat, different deal to answer some live questions. So last hour, we uh, started out with a couple of questions we'd gotten during the week, but we answered a bunch that were texted in right during the service. So if you've got a question about your faith, you can still do that. Go ahead and text it because they're popping them up on our screen, and we will do our best to answer those questions. But before we get started, I want to tell you about next week. Uh, guys, kids, next Sunday is Mother's Day. So if you hadn't started panicking and looking for that perfect gift, you need to start panicking. It's that point in time. Um, but bring your mom to church because we've got a special day at Kara City next Sunday. We've got a special message I'll be preaching just for moms. We've got a special gift for your mom. We've got photo booth for the family where you can take family pictures. Uh, we've got a couple of big things going on. One is we're doing child baby dedications. This is our first ever at Kara City Church, so we're excited about that. You can still participate. If you want to sign up for that, if you've got a baby or even a child that you've never dedicated, it's a time when we'll pray over your family and we'll challenge you to raise your child to love Jesus. And so you can still be a part of that. Let one of us know, particularly probably Selena or Lil out in children's ministry, let us know. And we got a special gift for the families that participate. We got people in both hours. The other thing we're doing is we are blessing some moms on Mother's Day. So we are, we partner with a mission organization called Two Lives Changed that works with young single moms. And so we're going to bless them on Mother's Day with gift cards. And so if you brought your gift cards today from Walmart, in the amount of $5 to $25, you can just drop them in the offering box as you go out those doors out of the sanctuary. It's right there on your right on the table. If you didn't bring gift cards today, you can still do that next Sunday on Mother's Day. Just bring your gift cards from Walmart, 5 to $25. We'll take those and give those out. All right. Well, we're going to get started now, and Chris is going to answer the first question. And this one is the same in both hours. Uh, it was a question that came in during the week, and we thought it was a really good question to start Plus, it secretly gives us a little time to actually prepare for the next question. So here's the first question that Chris is going to answer. What does God say about negative thoughts and intrusive thoughts, and can you be forgiven of them? I almost swapped the question up just at first just to mess you just up. But, <laughs> yeah. But that's the right. question. The mistake is you put a screen in front of me this time. It's, <laughs> it's weird. Like, I'm used to not having this up here. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a really good question, and I think this is something that a lot of us struggle with because I think at some point in your life, you have probably thought, man, I feel like the, that was not the way I normally think, the way I act. And, um, and, and so I just want to start here. I want to start with the reminder that God is not shocked by your thoughts. Uh, Psalm 139, 2 through 3 says, You know that when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down, and you are familiar with all of my ways. And so I think one of the first things we have to do is to remember and remind ourselves that, yes, we are sinful. Yes, we mess up. But God already knew that, that if God is truly omniscient and we believe that he knows all things, God knows your heart through and through. And so there's not really anything that we're going to do that's going to shock him with intrusive or negative thoughts. And so that's an important thing to remember first off. But the second half of that is, is that not only does God already know and isn't shocked, you need to remember that God prepared for this. He prepared for your sinfulness. And so that happened when he sent his son to die on a cross for you. So when we talk about intrusive and negative thoughts and, and we want to get into the idea of where do they come from, well, I think you actually do get an answer to this in the Bible. Uh, and this comes out of Ephesians 6. Paul wrote this. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So one of the things I think you have to remember first and foremost is that your faith is not you just walking through life. That if you live this out, and you're following God, you are waging war against the spiritual realm, that you're now part of God's army. And what that means also, and this is an important thing to remember, is that Satan, the devil, he will use every tactic he can to separate you from God. And one of the biggest things to remember about Satan that we learned very early on is that he is the deceiver. And so that means that he is really good at helping you to think the way that you're not supposed to. And so he will deceive you, he will lie to you, he will do everything he can to lead you against God. And that's why Paul says that we've got to take this seriously. He says, look, this is why in verse 13, we put on the full armor of God so that when that day comes, when we're tested, when Satan tries to bring these thoughts against you and fill your head with these things, that you're ready for it. Now, before we get into the, how do we respond to this? I, I want to answer this question because the, the last little bit of this was, how are we forgiven of 
our intrusive thoughts and our negative thoughts. What does God feel about them? And I want to remind you that you cannot change God's opinion about you. That there's nothing that you're going to do that shocks God. There's nothing you're going to do that changes the fact that he loves you. Remind yourselves that you are his most valued creation. Genesis 2, God formed us by hand. We're the only one that he did that to. Only part of his creation that he formed by hand. And God loved you so much that even in our depravity, in our complete sinfulness, he sent his son to die for you. And so right off the bat, remember, you can't change the way God feels about you. So the thoughts that you have don't affect that. The second part is, okay, if that's true, then how do I know I'm forgiven? Look with me really quick. You don't have to look at it. I'm sorry. I usually say that. But uh, this is a <laughs> Hebrews 4. And now I'm blanking on where it went in my notes. So I just got to scroll back up here. Here you go. This is verses 14 and 16. It says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he didn't sin. And this is the, this is the key part right here. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so one of, the, one of the big things I think we need to remind ourselves about God is that the sin doesn't beat the Savior. That yes, you will do things, you will think things, you will say things that can be horrible, but nothing you do will ever, co ever overcome the love and the grace and the power of God. And here, Paul writes that he is our high priest, and that is to remind us that even in the moments where we are unworthy to approach God, Jesus is worthy, that he was tempted in every way as us, he beat all these temptations, he ascended higher than anyone else, and now he intercedes on your behalf that yes, you aren't worthy to approach God, but he is. And through him, we get to have confidence in the grace and the forgiveness that we live in. So then the question becomes, how do we respond to this? So if we know, okay, we're forgiven of these thoughts, but we still know these thoughts happen, how do you try and prevent them as best you can? Well, there's a couple of scriptures on this that I think are important. And so one of them is Philippians 4, and this is verses 8 and 9. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So there's your thoughts. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So I think one of the important things to remind yourself of is that I think we have this tendency to focus on the negative. And whether that's that we are focusing on it because we're following it or we're focusing on it because we're trying to run from it, I still think that's a misguided focus. And I think that's another lie of Satan. I think the important thing to remember here, and this is why Paul says this, is that your goal is to focus on the godly things. So instead of trying to just avoid all the negative things, and that's a good, a good principle to live by, but your focus is on what is pure, what is godly, what is true, what is noble, what is admirable, all of these things that are worthy and excellent. This is where we put our focus, our time, our effort, and energy in. And so for you, that means, man, your energy needs to be in your relationship with God, in your reading of the Bible, in prayer, in being in community with God's people, and focusing on what's good. Because if you do that, it naturally replaces the bad things. And we see that in Romans 12. Paul wrote, he said, look, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing. Right there, again, focus on the good. And he says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. And this is what he says, because here's the kicker. If you're renewing your mind, if you're focusing on what's good, you're now able to test and approve what is God's will, God's pleasing and perfect will. And so that means that for you, in the moments where these thoughts come in that, that you know aren't yours, and you maybe don't feel that way, you get to decide and, and test, hey, that's Satan, that's not me. Hey, that's, that's not how I feel. This is what I know about God. This is what is true. And we're going to hold firm to that. So that's and just a quick recap, a reminder. Yes, you are forgiven for your thoughts. Yes, they happen. I do believe that that is a part of the way that Satan tries to separate you from God. But you are not unworthy of God's love. You are worthy because God made you worthy. And so the way we respond to that is that we follow God fully and we focus on the things of him. So, All right, here's the second question. And this is one that was asked first hour but somebody has already texted it in again this hour, and it was a really good question, so I'm going to answer it again because I think it's something that we, we all need to hear. Here, there's two questions that are kind of combined. First of all, is it a sin to doubt your faith in severe trials and tribulation? And the second part of that is, when life is tearing you down, how can we break through the pain? And those are great questions that we all struggle with. All right, let me start with the first one. The first one, is it a sin to doubt your faith when things are really difficult? The answer is... 
Yes, it is. Having said that, (laughs) it is a sin that we have all struggled with at different points in time. We're all in this together. It is our human nature to doubt God, to doubt his goodness, to rebel against him. That's the sin nature that we have. And so in those moments that we are struggling, we begin to doubt God. It is a sin, and and I'll give you the trick here in just a second, but, but I think what happens to us in those moments is we withdraw. So often I hear people that they'll reach out to me and say, hey, we hadn't been in a church, we hadn't been in church for several months because things have been really tough. And I'm thinking, well, that's the, that's the wrong decision. I don't say it that harshly, but I'm thinking that's the wrong decision because we have to cling to God. So is it a sin to doubt God in those moments? Yes, we're all there. The trick is don't stay there. Does that make sense? Do what it takes to answer the questions you've got, the doubts you've got, move forward. One of my favorite passages of scripture about doubt is in Mark 9, 24. And Jesus is walking and this man comes up and wants Jesus to heal his son that uh, is demon possessed. And I think this is one of the most honest confessions of our human doubt and wondering. Here's what this father says to Jesus when he asks for his help. He says, I believe help my unbelief. And that's so often I find myself in that exact same spot. I believe in Jesus, but I start to doubt his goodness. I start to doubt that he is looking out for the best interest of me because things aren't going my way. We have these plans of what we think God's going to do. God's going to give us the perfect marriage. He's going to give us perfect kids that never mess up. (laughs) That ain't going to happen. He's going to do all of these different things. And then when it doesn't work out the way we thought, we kind of blame God for that. We're like, why did, why did this happen? But Jesus never says, God never says it won't be difficult in this life. So my, my first answer to the first question is, yes, it is sin to doubt God, but it's a sin every one of us have struggled with at some point in time. And my challenge and what I have to do for me is answer that doubt. Go find the answer. Talk to somebody that can pour into you. And that's why God's people are so important because we rally around one another and you can say, hey, I'm struggling. Here's what's going on in my life. And I'm, I just, I'm doubting God's goodness at the moment. I'm doubting that God's exist and we can talk through that and we can work through it. So don't stay there. All right. So the second part is when life is tearing you down, how can we break through the pain? So you're in that moment where everything is tough and how do, we, how do we change it? How do we move forward out of that place? Let me first tell you some really bad theology that you hear. You'll hear someone say, oh, honey, I don't know why I'm going to use this voice, but I am. Oh, honey, God will never give you anything you can't handle. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> yeah, horrible theology. It's just not true. God will absolutely give you situations you are not capable of handling. He will put you in circumstances or allow you to be in circumstances that are too big for you. And unfortunately, you'll even be in hardship and difficulty and trouble that you can't handle. And God puts you there for a reason or lets you get there for a reason so that you trust him. Here's the good theology. So Jesus is talking to his disciples and he's just told them some really tough stuff that he's going to die. He's going to leave them, that there's going to be all these issues going on and problems. And needless to say, they're a little nervous. They're a little troubled in that moment. And Jesus says this to them in John 16, and he says it to us as well. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That's the good theology. Jesus is bigger than whatever you're going through. His grace is greater than whatever struggle you have, whatever difficult situation. Yeah, that's all right to clap for. Grace is a big deal. That's, that's the good theology. But here's where you have to take a step. Rally to Jesus. He's there. He's waiting to embrace you, carry you, love you, comfort you. But what we so often do is we walk away. We walk away from the church. We pull back. We withdraw from God's people. God so often uses his people to comfort one another. And so the worst thing you can do is withdraw from God's people, withdraw from God's church, because it's in that church that you get teaching and wisdom from God and you get the love of God's people. So that's one thing you can do is make sure you're, you're clinging to God. You're moving closer to him in those moments. Here's the other thing. Remember that the best is yet to come. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever struggle you have, that's not the end of your story. The end of your story is in heaven. 
And we have to remind ourselves of that. The Bible says that God is looking out for our good. And so often we think, well, that's, this isn't good, what I'm going through. God's got a different perspective. And so I love how the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4.18. He says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So it's saying, whatever struggle you've got right now, it's not the end of the story. God sees the end of the story, and he, has, he knows that one of these days, you're going to be in a place where there's no sadness, no pain, no hurt, no death, no tears. Yeah. And so I use this little illustration. If you've been around a while, you've probably heard me say this before, but this is kind of the way I think about this. Let's say on January 1st of this year, you were going to a bowl party, some college bowl party, and on the way you had a wreck. Totaled your car, you were injured, the ambulance comes, they load you on the gurney, they're pushing you towards the ambulance, you fall off the side of the gurney, you break your arm, they load you, get back up, get you in the ambulance, the ambulance has a wreck on the way, you're injured more, now your neck is hurting, they get you to the hospital, you sit in the emergency room for hours, nobody even realizes you're hurt, you hurt. You sit there and finally you get in and you get taken care of. It's a really bad day. But then let's say a couple of days later, an uncle that you didn't even know existed dies and leaves leaves you $30 million. And you spend the rest of that year traveling around the world just seeing the beauty of God, experiencing all of different countries. And you have this amazing year where you experience things you've never experienced before. And you get to the end, and you're, at a, you're now at a New Year's Eve party at the end of the year, and you're telling everybody how amazing your year has been. And somebody says, didn't you have a wreck? I mean, I was there. Your January 1st was horrible for you. And you stop for a minute, and you go, yeah, I guess that's right. But since then, it's been awesome. That's what heaven is for us. And so that's why Paul says, don't fix your eyes on what's here, because it's temporary. Keep your eyes fixed on eternity because that's where you'll that's where your story ends so that's the way you move on beyond it yeah uh, so real quick we'll just talk about one question we got in somebody did ask me specifically if i have drafted a formal apology towards the houston texans and, <laughs> uh, the answer to that is uh, as much as you would love me to know you drafted cj stroud win some games and i'll take back what i said but wow you're, you're <laughs> going going deeper into it <laughs> If our Uh, church breaks apart, I'm blaming you. I'm just telling you. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So this is a question we got. I'm trying to get back to it up in here. We added a few. Um, So somebody said specifically, they said, I'm having trouble believing that Paul's writings are anointed. And this is someone who advocated hitting one's wife as long as the object was no thicker than a thumb. And overall, he thought very little of women. So please help me understand how this is really spirit breathed. Okay. So really quickly. Uh, the and I, I googled it. Don't worry, just to be sure. I did my little research for you. There is not a single area in Scripture where Paul approved beating one's wife. Uh, in fact, we see the opposite. If you look at Ephesians, you know Paul actually says specifically that we're to treat our wives gently and to treat them well. That we are actually to submit and to give our lives towards our wife. Um, so, on that side, if if you think that that you can disagree with me on that, I'll be glad to talk to you about that. Um, and then to talk about his, his role with women, um, there's a couple of things that I think we can talk about here. One of them is, I, I think, to say that Paul had a harsh or very little view of women, I think, is unfair. Um, I think it's a little generalized. And I think you can even see examples in Romans 16 where uh, he's giving a list of people that the church should greet. You know, he talks about Phoebe, who's a deacon of the church, and he, he specifically says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe. And so this is a, that's a woman in leadership right there who's actively serving in the church, and Paul commends that. And he goes on to talk about Priscilla and Aquila, co- my co-workers in Christ Jesus who risked their lives for him. Uh, and so there, there's different examples we can give towards that um, that show that, that Paul had some views towards women's teachings, but to say that Paul had a negative view of women, I don't think is very accurate. I think Paul believed very, uh, very strongly in biblical roles and if you're looking at scriptures like 1 Corinthians where he even talks about should women be silent in the church or should they speak up or should they dress, I think it's important to understand some of the cultural norms at that time and understand why Paul might have written that. Uh, and so one of the big things that scholars will say back to this is specifically that Paul is trying to, in their, in the, I think the word they use is to make the teaching of Christ approachable and attractive. And we can argue against whether or not we agree with that. But 
One of the things that was important back then is that there's a difference in the way the ro women had roles then and the way women have roles now. And so for Paul, what he was saying was that women should conform to their role in society at that point. The argument can be made, right, that we believe that, that women have different roles in society. And so the way that this is reconciled in the church now is that women have different roles back then. They have different roles now. We are a much more individualistic society today where a lot more of the responsibility of your life and your outcome of that life is placed on you. Back then, that was not a thing, right? Your, in fact, your husband, if you were married, was legally responsible for you. It's a little different now. Um, and so for Paul, there are teachings, and, and Nathan, you're more than welcome to ex expand on that if you'd like to. Um, but <laughs> <What>? <laughs> throw, you out on, throw you out on that. I'm not listening um, to you. I'm working. You're good. Um, but I would say ultimately... You know, the point here, I think Paul, Paul did not have as harsh of a, a view of women, I think, as sometimes we try to make it out to be. Um, and again, if you disagree with me on that, I'm, I'm, I totally understand. But, um, and, and you guys are probably well aware of our stance on this. I mean, we've had women pastors here on staff before I got here. Uh, and in fact, and you know, you guys will hear this later, but I mean, in the summer, we've got Barbie will be back here preaching again. And so, uh, yeah, we're excited about that. We love Barbie. Um, so I hope that does clear up some of our view on that, maybe a little bit of that. And then also if you're someone who struggles with the validity of Paul, just from a historical standpoint, I'll kind of remind you quickly about some of the stuff that we talked about, uh, back at Easter that, um, we know that Paul was a historical man. We know that he was actually historically responsible for a large part of the growth of the early church. Uh, and we know that he wrote several of the letters. In fact, he wrote two-thirds of our New Testament. Uh, and so even when you look at letters like Ephesians or Romans, things like that, a lot of these are written very early on in, um, in his faith and very early on right after Jesus' death. I mean, it's 1 Corinthians, I think we looked at it, it was 40 years after Jesus' death was when he actually wrote that, and he had been a Christian for about 20 years up to that point. Um, so there's a lot of historical accuracy to who Paul is. Um, but I, I do believe that when we start talking about roles of women and, and Paul and his treatment of that, I think sometimes I think we have a tendency to put our own viewpoint on it. I think it's important to understand the cultural changes between then and now and how I think that shifts our view of, of how people operate in society. Um, I think even just the way churches operate, it's a good example of that. I mean, the way that we do church nowadays is so different from the way they would have done church. And I don't, I think in some ways you could argue whether that's good or bad, um, but I think there's reasons why those changes have been made. And I think the same thing is true for, for the way that, that women have roles in the church and in society today. So hopefully that helps answer that a little bit. So, so I'm actually gonna, I've actually took some time here at the end uh, to look. So here's what, uh, to me, the writing of Paul that goes to the heart of his opinion about this is in Ephesians 5. Uh, when we're at 21, uh, that little section, and it's, then he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he says that wives should respect their husbands, that they should submit. Remember, that was the law, and he was saying be consistent with that. But then he said something to husbands that would have blown them out of the water. Yep. They would have been so uncomfortable listening to this because so, it was so countercultural to the, that day. And w I mean, at that point in the Roman Empire, men could beat their wives legally. They could even have them killed if they wanted to. They could divorce for any reasons. And Paul says in verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and yep. gave himself for up for her. That would have been so countercultural and crazy sounding because there's this challenge to husbands to love their wives like Jesus loved the church. What did Jesus do for his church? Died for it. If that's not love of a man for his wife, I don't know what is. And so, yeah, and so I hear men will tell me, oh, I'd die for my wife, but then they're out all the time with their buddies and their wife is home alone. And I'm like, dude, if you're willing to die for your wife, then you better live for your wife. That's the challenge. That's what Paul said. Yeah, that's what Paul said. So I, I think Paul fully understood the day of people he was talking to, but he also was challenging us to something that Jesus challenged us to, which was so countercultural that we're to love our wives in a way that we love greater than ourselves because yep. Jesus died for us. And so we're to die for our wives and we're also to live for them. All right, let me answer another question that came in this hour. And actually it's two that are related that just came in. The first one is, is baptism necessary to be saved? And then the second one is, how do you know when you're ready to be baptized? Been wanting to for years, but I don't know how to tell if I'm truly ready. So first question, is baptism necessary to be saved? The short answer of that is, no. Having said that, it's incredibly important. So 
John 3.16 that we all know tells us what it looks like to follow Jesus, what it looks like to be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes shall not die but have eternal life. When we have a belief that changes who we are, that's when we're saved. Does that make sense? Now, belief is not just like, oh, I guess I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. Yeah, historically. No, no, no. When it's, the Bible is talking about belief, it includes this idea that we believe so much that we repent of our sins, we make Jesus our Lord and our Savior, and we chase after him. That's what it looks like to believe. Because there's another place where James, the half-brother of Jesus, is saying, so you believe in God? Big deal. Even the demons do that, and they shudder. And what James is saying to us is a belief that matters is a belief that transforms who we are. See, the demons believe in Jesus. They're scared to death of Jesus. But it doesn't change the way they act. It doesn't change the way they live. It doesn't change the way we think. So that's what saves us. But baptism is incredibly important. Remember that Jesus walked 60 miles to be baptized in the River Jordan. And he had never committed a sin. He set the example for us for how important it is. There were no first century Christians back in the book of Acts or, or shortly thereafter that were walking around unbaptized. If for lack of a better term, this is going to sound a little college it's initiation. That's what it is. You want to follow Jesus? Be baptized. It was that simple. They, they didn't wait. They didn't set up big days months down the road. You want to follow Jesus? be baptized. And so it's incredibly important. It is not necessary for salvation, but when I hear people say, oh, it's just another act of obedience, and it's way more than that. It is the first act of obedience. Does that make sense? How do you want to start a relationship with Jesus when you go, I follow you, but the thing you did, the thing you tell us to do, I'm not ready for that. I'm a little concerned about the heart. Does that make sense? Not a water issue, it's a heart issue. So that's what I would say about that. And then how do I know when I'm ready to be baptized. I think there's this misperception that, that we think, oh, I got to get my life cleaned up. I, I believe in Jesus. I want to follow him, but I need to do all of these different things, and then I'll be worthy of being baptized and following Jesus. And the reality is you will never be worthy to be baptized. Never. Jesus made you worthy. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in that moment, in that moment, when you decide to follow Jesus, Jesus makes you worthy. And, and so I think about the, 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 the Samaritan woman at the well. Uh, I think about so many examples where they'd lived this life that was a mess. How about the thief on the cross? The thief on the cross had lived his entire life as a criminal that was bad enough to be crucified. That's bad. You didn't, that was a harsh penalty, the harshest penalty that the Roman Empire had at that point in time. And what happened? In that moment, he believed he said, Jesus, I, I don't even deserve anything from you. Just remember me. And Jesus said, you'll be with me. So that's, we see that picture. But here's what we say about baptism. So Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost, and there's all these people that are out there listening, and it's really the first church service, if you want to get right down to it. And it says that when he told them about what they had done for, to Jesus, that they had, their, their sin had sent him to the cross. And it says they were broken, and they said, what do we do? And Peter says in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's saying you repent, you believe, that's happened, you repent, and then what's our next step? We baptize. It's a big deal. And then going back to answer, when should I be baptized? I think there's this voice that whispers, wait, wait, you, you, you're not ready. That's not Jesus that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is saying, follow me now. Jesus was always about, follow me now. Get up, drop your nets, follow me now. I love Acts twenty two nineteen. 19. It says, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. I love that. Just let's go. You believe? Let's go. So that's what it looks like. After church, we're going to have three baptisms, and you're going to get to see that beautiful illustration of what it looks like when someone dies to their old life of sin. They're buried in the water just like Jesus was buried in the tomb. And then they a picture of them rising to a new life in Jesus. Baptism is not necessary for salvation, but it's incredibly important. And it would be a mistake to wait when you follow Jesus. Yeah. Um, so next question for you guys is somebody asked, what does it mean spiritually if I feel my prayers are repetitive and go unheard due to the sinful life that I have lived? 
Okay, so there's a couple of ways I want to tackle this one because I think there's several different little pieces that we need to talk about. Um, so the first one is, let's, let's go ahead and answer the question, does God hear my prayers? And does God hear my prayers if I'm a sinner? Okay, so here's what I want to remind you of right off the bat. Are we unworthy to approach God? Talked about this a minute ago. Yes. And here's what I want to say about that. I think it's a mistake to think that God doesn't care about you or care about what you have to say. That being said, God's opinion of you does not change the condition of your heart, nor does it change your standing with God before the throne of judgment. The reality is, right, is that in our sinfulness, we're unworthy to approach God even in prayer. And we see this in Isaiah 59, 1 through 2. It said, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. And specifically here, that translation of he will not hear you isn't that God can't hear you. It's that he chooses in that moment not to hear. Now, here's the catch, though, is that, yes, you are unworthy. But you need to remember that in Christ, that changes everything because you may not be worthy, but Jesus is. And so you're able to be counted worthy, not because of what you've done or as a result of what you've done, but because of what Jesus did. And I'll go back to Hebrews 4 again, that same verse I read a minute ago, is that since we have a great priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, we hold firmly to the face we profess, for we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with us on our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And so I think right there, again, when you look at the idea of a priest, remember that they prayed on your behalf. That was a big part of the priestly uh, role in Israel. And so when we're in the new covenant, that's not the role anymore. Jesus now takes the place of that priest as our high priest. And so he intercedes on our behalf. So when we pray, we are praying with Jesus praying on our behalf. Does that make sense? And so that changes it for us because now in the moments where we were unworthy, Jesus' worthiness covers that. His blood covers all of our sin. And when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. And that means he does, in fact, hear us. And he wants to hear you. Revelations talks about your prayers being like incense to God, that he takes pleasure in the words of his people. Now, I think there is a catch with this because I do believe there is a difference in someone who has been sinning and someone who is constantly living in sin. And I think that this is true. Uh, in James 5, one of the verses you read is that a prayer of a righteous man, righteous man is powerful and effective. Key with that, we are made righteous in Christ, but I think we have to follow that out to live that out. Does that make sense? And so, yes, I do believe there is some truth in saying, well, all I've done is just sin and 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 run further away from God. But then when something bad happens in my life, I prayed and nothing happened. I think, well, that's a selfish prayer first. And second, I don't think that's a shock that God would turn away from us when, when it's our iniquity. But if we are actively seeking a relationship with God, I do believe that he's faithful to answer our prayers because Jesus said he's faithful to answer our prayers. And then really quickly, just as we talk about the repetitive prayer, and, and if, I understand you may be saying that you're, your prayer became repetitive because of your sin, uh, but I do think it's important to say it like this. Um, there is a difference in praying for the same things over and over again and going through the motions. And so, and I think Jesus talked about this, and I'm not going to go through the whole scripture because I know that we're getting close to time here, but um, Matthew 6, when he talks about what we call the Lord's Prayer, I think we made the mistake early on in the church of taking the Lord's Prayer and going, that we've got to repeat that over and over again. And so most of you probably in this room, even if you're not much of a, a Christian, you probably can repeat the Lord's Prayer back to me because that is like indoctrinated in us. But Jesus gave that as an example of how we're supposed to pray. And his whole point behind that is prayer is casual, prayer is short, and prayer is communication with our Father. And so there should be something real and intimate about it. And so it's okay if you feel like you pray for some of the same things. I, I would say most of the people in this room pray for a lot of the same things every day. But you also can add to that. And so that's, that's my encouragement and my challenge to you. I would say if, if you're living a life of sin and you're running away from God and thinking he'll answer your prayers, turn back to God. Because I think he's faithful to answer your prayers when you do that. Um, but if your challenge is also that you're struggling with the idea that your prayers feel like they're the same, uh, my challenge to you would be try and pray a little more casually. I, I, I love, um, when I was back in Georgia, I had a, a college student in our college ministry, and every prayer she prayed, she started with the same thing. She'd go, hey, God. And I love that, because at first it kind of catches you off guard a little bit. You're like, can you do that? 
Yes, you can. And so for you, I think it may help if you're struggling with the idea of repetition and feeling like you need to get the words right. Remind yourselves that Jesus says, hey, don't pray like the pagans. You don't have to be wordy. You don't have to fill it with a bunch of things. Just talk to God because he hears you. It's when we die, where are our souls until God's return? And along with that, are there genders in heaven? Yeah, so they're kind of related. So I want to answer both of them. And I want to start with where are our souls when we die until Jesus' return. And there's really two schools of thought by smart theologians that have different perspectives. Here are the two perspectives. One of them is that immediately when we die, we, our souls go to heaven and we're immediately with God, with Jesus in heaven. And then eventually our physical bodies will be perfected and, and raised and we'll have a physical resurrection when Jesus returns. The other perspective that other theologians would say is that we sleep until Jesus returns. And that so when we die, we, whether that's, you know, six months, six years, or 6,000 years, we sleep and then we're resurrected when uh, Jesus dies. Let me point you to the scripture on both of those and then I'll tell you what I believe. Uh, those that would say that we sleep would point mainly to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. And keep in mind, all of this is Paul's teaching. So when you hear different perspectives, it's not different people saying different things. It's all the Apostle Paul writing about this. But I'll give you the, the reason that I believe what I believe. All right, so for those that would say you sleep, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that you who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. And, and so then he goes on in verses 16 and 17 and talks about the rapture um, and that the, the dead in Christ will rise. And I believe Paul here is talking about comfort. He is comforting the people who are still alive, who've lost loved ones, he is not talking about our souls here. He's reminding us as the living that those who have preceded us in death, we're going to see them again. We're, they're going to see their physical bodies one day. And so you get a sense probably of what I think. I don't think we sleep. I think we immediately, our souls immediately go to Jesus. But that, for those theologians who would say we sleep, that's the passage that they look at. For, for those who believe that our souls immediately go to heaven, we look at a couple of other passages for Paul, one of which is very specific teaching and why I believe this one is more indicative of the biblical truth of what happens and not a passage of comfort for those of us who have lost loved ones. So 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 9, Paul says this, therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. So when we're here, we're away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. So he's saying when we're in the body, we're separated by our sin. We're separated physically from God. We don't get to see him, uh, even though we can feel his presence. But when we die, when we're no longer in this body, that we're with the Lord. And, and to me, that is very direct teaching about what happens. But you see later, Paul it writes another passage of Scripture in Philippians 1, 21 through 23, where he is talking about his own death. And he is talking about what he wants to see happen with his own body. And listen to what he says. For to me, to live in, is Christ and to die is gain. If, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. In other words, he can keep working to, to share the message of Jesus. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. So Paul is contemplating his own mortality. And he's saying, which is better? I can stay here. I can keep working. With, but I have to be here and away from Jesus. Or I can die and go and be with Jesus. And the question is, if you sleep, why is Paul in such a hurry to, to leave his body? He wants to leave his body because he wants to go be with Jesus. And keep in mind, Paul knew what he was talking about because Paul had actually been taken to heaven to, be, to see what it was like. So it's not like he was just guessing here. These were God's words that Paul was giving us. There's also a parable uh, about Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16 that gives us a little indication too. Uh, so it talks about that Lazarus, a very poor man, had died and went to heaven, and a rich man had died and gone to hell. 
And it's clear that life is continuing because his, the rich man's brothers are still living. And in fact, he wants Lazarus to go tell his brothers about Jesus because he says, look, if, if a dead man comes back and tells about Jesus, maybe they'll decide to follow Jesus. And so we see this picture that Jesus gives us of people in heaven talking about people still on earth. And so that's another indicator that we are, when we are physically gone from this body, our spirits immediately go to heaven, but then eventually we will be resurrected into a more perfect body. Mine's going to be really thin, by the way. Um, so genders in heaven. We can kind of start with that picture of Lazarus in, in heaven and the rich man in hell. They're dead. They're in heaven and hell, and they still have genders. It clearly refers to them as him. I mean, it, it's very clear that they have genders in heaven. We also know that Jesus, after he died, rose from the dead and is in heaven. He still has a gender. He is male. It's, the Bible's very clear of that. Now, the Bible does not specifically say there are genders in heaven. So we're making inferences based on this parable, based on the fact that Jesus has a gender, even though he has died and is now in heaven, it's still pretty clear. The other thing we know is that God made genders. He created them and it was good. And so when we get our perfect bodies, we're going to recognize one another in heaven. The Bible's clear about that. We're going to know and be known. And so I think when you look at all these different inferences, it's pretty clear that we will retain our genders in heaven. Like I said, we'll get these new and perfect bodies, but it will still be us and people will recognize who we are. Yeah. So uh, next question I ha we had was uh, original sin. So essentially this question is asking, okay, we understand there's a sin nature. So are we born as a sinner who's condemned to hell already? Or is it a result of our actions that we are then condemned? Are we born innocent and then condemned? So let's start with this. Uh, I think we first need to understand that we've all sinned. Can we just make that establishment? Is that fair to say this morning? Uh, 1 John 1, 8 says, if we have claimed to be without sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. So right off the bat, we are sinners, period. Cool? All right. But here's the deal. You do not start out as sinners. It is an inclination that's within us. And there's a couple of different ways that we can talk about this. So first, we'll address, I'm going to address Romans 5. Romans 5 tells us that, that death entered the world through one man. It entered through Adam, right? But you also need to look at that and say, okay, well, Romans 6 is a little bit more of an explanation of that, right? That that's the wages of sin are death. And so it's not your birth that condemns you to death. It's your actions that condemn you. And there's a couple of things about this. I'm not going to get too much into the innocence of children, but I do want to briefly mention that, that Jesus says this in Mark 10, 15. He says, truly, I tell you, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms and he blessed them. And so why does, he have, why does he say that? Why do we have to receive the kingdom of God like a child? I think there's multiple reasons within that, but I think one of the big things is, is that children are innocent. When, when you're at a certain age, there's a point where I believe you do, you become aware and accountable for your actions. But there's a point where children have no idea what they're doing. And from the moment you're born, when you think about like an infant in particular, they, they have no possible way to sin because they can't do anything except eat, cry, sleep, and poop. So it's really hard to say, well, we're just born condemned to hell when I think scripture talks about it a little bit differently. Uh, and there's a couple of other ways you can look at this. Uh, Romans 8, 5 through 7 says this. It says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. And so the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. And so the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to his law, nor can it do so. And so those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And so here's what Paul's saying in all this, right, is that we need to understand that there is something that we refer to as sin nature. And so what this means for us is that sin is inevitable for us. It's not the beginning, but it is at some point going to be the result of your actions. And so that's a real thing for us to understand, that it's a part of who we are, that we are rebellious to God. And again, going back to Romans 5, it's a result of of Adam and Eve because sin came into the world through Adam and he's the person who, right, we get all our original DNA comes from him. That's passed down through us as well. And so the big thing for this is that for all of us to become the one who's unclean, right? And so this is Isaiah 64, 6. It says, for all of us to become like the one who's unclean and all of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment and all of us wither like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. So again, right here, you see, he says, look, he says, all of us at some point, what? become, we have become unclean. So there's a moment 
in our lives where we were clean, but we messed that up. So we need to understand that we don't start out, un- we don't start out unclean, but we inevitably become unclean as a result of our actions. And so I, I think really the big question then from here is what do we do with that, right? Because I think a lot of times the reason that we ask this question, I think, is we want to understand what our place is, how we got here, and what do we do from here, right? And so here's what we're going to recap really quickly if, if you didn't catch on to what I was saying. We are not born in sin. We are born with a sin nature. And so you have an inclination within you, a desire, as Paul calls it in Romans 7, a struggle, that you're going to constantly fight the desire to do evil. That's a part of who we are. But there is something that changes in us when we're in Jesus. And so this is Romans 8, 9 through 10. So this is a continuation of the passage we read a second ago. He said, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh anymore, but you're in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, that even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And so I think one of the things that we have a tendency to do in general is, is I think we really like to focus on our guilt and, and we like to think about how unworthy we are and how much we're sinners. And I think that in some ways it's good, it's humbling for us, and I think that we are supposed to mourn over our sin. But you've got to remember what our focus is. And so the way that we move forward in this is that if you are a believer, that, that condemnation of sin no longer has any rule over you. Right? That's Romans 8.1, that there is no condemnation in Christ. And so the way that we move forward in this is we move forward with faith in Jesus because it's in faith in Jesus that we find righteousness and we find life. So you're not born a sin, but you do sin, and Jesus is the answer to that. Uh, so we just got this question in just a minute ago as well, uh, and said, if, and I'm gonna, this is a long one, so just bear with me for a second. If someone is intimidated by the church because of superficial Christians and Sunday-only Christians, what questions do you recommend to ask or do to bring them closer to Christ? I believe conversations of personal testimony that everyone sends and conversations of a personal relationship with Christ are starting points, but what else? Um, so this is, I think, and if you don't mind for a second, I may give you a little bit of harsh truth for a minute here. I think one of the, one of the things that we have to be very careful about as Christians is start deciding in our mind who's superficial and service level and Sunday only. Um, if you're someone who struggles with the idea of church being nothing but a bunch of hypocrites, I'm going to give you a quick challenge, and, and this is Jesus' words in Matthew 7, It says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck in your brother's. I I think one of the the big dangers that we can make as the church is that we start to expect everyone to be perfect. Uh, And the minute we start putting ourselves in a place of superiority over others and start saying, well, I'm a better Christian than you, and, you know, and so I need to separate myself from you. I think that we have, we have sorely missed Jesus's purpose for his church. Um, but on the other side of that, I will also say that I do understand that there is a real negative view of the church. And I understand that for some of you, you may be hurt by the church and maybe you've, you've been around people who have, you know, they are the hand raisers and the people who are serving and doing all this. And really they're, they're horrible people. Um, I get that. It it does happen, and it's the reality of, again, going back to the last question I talked about, we are messed up people. Um, But there should be some encouragement in that as well, is that I think this is the place for those people. Jesus said, this is uh, Matthew 9, 12 through 13, he said, on hearing this, I remind you, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. And so if, if our church ever gets to a point where we're nothing but a bunch of righteous people. I think we have done our job wrong um, because there are billions of people who are lost and billions of people who need Jesus. Um, Now, if you are talking to your friend who struggles with this concept and struggles with the idea of being around people who are superficial, hypocritical, Sunday Christians, whatever you want to call them, I think one of the big things to encourage them is, and I talked about this in the sermon a couple of weeks ago, um, but there is not a perfect community out there. You are never going to walk into any building, especially a church, and go, everyone fits exactly the mold I want them to fit. They do exactly what I want them to do. They say exactly what I want them to say. They are perfect. Um, But here's what I I think is important with that is that you build the community you want. 
And so if, if you're looking at a group of people and saying, man, I just, I wish they knew Jesus better. Okay, well, that's a challenge on you. Uh, and so I, I think we need to be careful to be worried about the church hurting us because people are just like us, if that makes sense. Uh, because if, if you're also not going to church, you're putting yourself in the same category of the people that you're scared of. Um, and so I, and I think that that actually is a good thing to remember that the goal of the church is not for you to, to look righteous. It is for us to grow closer to God together. Uh, and a part of that is discipleship. And so if you're someone who struggles with the idea of the people around you not following Jesus closely, then, then you should be an even bigger part of leading them to Jesus and closer. And I, yes, I do think that if your question is, how do I help someone who's struggling with that? Yes, I think personal testimonies of the way that church has helped you is a big thing. I think if I'm being real with you, I think if it's someone struggling with church, you can talk about your relationship with Jesus, but I think really they need to see more importantly the ways that community has actually helped you. And it's okay to, to be real and share the honest truth because again, if, if you make church out to be perfect and, and you say there's never going to be anybody that have problems, anything like that, I think you're setting people up for, for poor expectations uh, because that's not the reality of who we are or what we do. Um, so here's what I think we do in response to that real quick. This is Acts 2. It said, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. And so they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I think the best thing that we can do in response to this is to love people well, to be in community with people. And I think that if we can do that and we can actually be the church and show people what community is supposed to look like, I think you'll start to break down some of the fears that people have in that. And so I don't think there's a magic question or conversation you can have with them that's really going to change their mind. People need to see actions more than they see words. So, All right, we got time for one last question, and this will be a quick one. Uh, quick one. This also came in uh, during this service. Is it a sin to doubt your faith in severe trials and tribulation? And the answer is yes. Having said that, we all do it. Uh, we have a sin nature. We have a nature where we doubt the goodness of God even when we can see it all around us. And so when you ask the question, is it a sin to doubt, I have to answer the question honestly, and that is yes, it is sin but it is a sin that we all struggle with. And so what happens is we have this expectation of what God's going to do. When God's going to give us the right marriage. He's going to give us the right kids. They're going to all be successful. They're never going to have health problems. And we build these expectations on what God is going to do for us. And then when God doesn't do it the way we thought he would, we become disenchanted and we begin to question is God real? Does God love me? Is God good? And we begin to have those doubts. We all struggle with those things on occasion. And here's what I would tell you is, it's okay to doubt. Don't stay there. Does that make sense? We're all going to have those moments. That's part of being human. But the trick is to make sure we deal with those doubts, that we don't withdraw, that we don't go, well, you know what, I'm doubting God, so I'm not going to go to church for a month because you may hear something in church that reminds you or challenges you in that moment. And one of my favorite passages of scripture about this is, I think it's one of the most relatable confessions in the Bible that just speaks to me because I feel this sometimes. And it's where the father of a demon-possessed boy, he brings his son to Jesus to heal him. And here's what he says to Jesus when he asks for help. He says in Mark 9, 24, I believe, help my unbelief. And I feel like that's where I am sometimes. God, I believe in you, but man, I'm struggling right now. now I'm hurting and I don't understand why you would do this, why you would allow this. And, and I think that's okay to pray to God. I do that. God, I love you. I know you are real. Help my unbelief. Help me get through this point. And, and so I would tell you that, yes, it is human to doubt. It is human to wonder. If it is sin, the answer is yes. But the point is, we're all in that together. We're going to have those moments, but don't stay there. 
Challenge God's people. Ask God's people. Ask somebody, how do, I, how do I deal with this? Rally around one. We're supposed to encourage and spur one another on. That's what this community is about. And, and so I think so often we withdraw and we should do just the opposite. We would, should rally around God's people because it's God's people who pour into us and help us get through those. So answer is yes, it, it is sin, but you're not alone. We all sin. We struggle with that and doubt and unbelief is something. Help me with my unbelief. That should be our prayer on a regular basis.